Welcome back my friends. I'm so glad you all enjoyed uh, the new camera and the new mic in the last video. So I'm making this one fairly quickly after the last one. So there's some, still some things you guys mentioned that I'll, I'll definitely fix and change up with the audio. Uh, but for now, let's just continue on. So there was this, I mentioned a second story uh, that I was meant to tell in the last video, but I, I, you know, it was already getting quite long. So I figured we'd search Kurz Kazar, see if he had another nuclear video, and he, he did. So we're checking this one out today, uh, and then I can tell you this other story, which is also maybe even better. And if you didn't watch the last video, the Cal VPN Alpha is out now, and you can go download it and use it for free. So what it is, I didn't mention it really, it's a post-quantum VPN, which means, theoretically, it can protect you from quantum computers. Specifically, you know, capture now and decrypt later attacks which are something that people are starting to really worry about. So come help me out. You can use it for free. We need some testing done. There's only a Windows app at the moment. There's a, a Mac, a Linux, Android, iOS. That's all coming for the beta, which hopefully we can get in a month. Or, so, you know, come read more on our website. If you're interested, come download it. Let me know if you find any bugs with the software. Anyway, let's get into the video. Worst nuclear accidents in history. Let's check it out. Nuclear energy creates an uneasy feeling of danger for many people. Ancient and dangerous minerals are concentrated to awaken seemingly unnatural powers, creating horribly toxic elements that, if they escape, can and have killed people in horrible ways. How many people has nuclear energy killed and how? That's terrifying. Nuclear energy has been a thing since 1951, and since then, there have been around 30 reported accidents globally. Most of them were pretty minor compared to the two disasters everybody is familiar with, Fukushima and Chernobyl. Chernobyl is undoubtedly the worst nuclear accident in history for a number of reasons. The reactor technology was old and ill-prepared for emergencies, and the government response was slow and more concerned about image than damage control. Still, only 31 people died directly in the accident. But what makes nuclear energy scary is not reactors blowing up, but the radiation they release. If you're wondering, there's zero risk of a nuclear bomb when it comes to nuclear power plants. Uh, you know, put simply, the fuel used inside every nuclear reactor is not sufficiently enriched enough to make a runaway chain reaction even a possibility. Like, the material isn't capable of creating a nuclear explosion. So the real question is how many deaths through cancer and other diseases will Chernobyl cause? Here, things get really complicated because you dip right into controversy, and just discussing the different estimates and how they were calculated deserves a video of its own. The most pessimistic estimate comes from a study commissioned by the European Green Party and projects up to 60,000 premature deaths by the year 2065. Most scientific studies come up with numbers much lower than this. The WHO has estimated that in total, the long-term death toll will be around 4,000. While the UN Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation concluded that even this figure could be too high. For more details on this, check our research document. Nuclear accident was Fukushima Daiichi in 2011. Fukushima did not only operate with much better technology that was less dangerous in the first place, much better security measures were in place, and the official response was fast and decisive. And so the current death toll is only 573. The major difference here is that these deaths were not a consequence of radiation. They were indirect deaths from the stress of the evacuation of the areas around the reactors and occurred almost entirely in older populations. Estimates of the possible long-term deaths from radiation vary widely, from none at all to about 1,000. In terms of the other long-term consequences, an increase in thyroid cancer in children has been observed, but according to the WHO, this is related to the increased screening rate. By 2018, there had been only one confirmed death among workers as a result of radiation-induced lung cancer. Now, let's compare this to renewable energy. Solar wind and geothermal energy basically only cause deaths as a result of construction and maintenance accidents. Unfortunately, their current share of global energy is pretty low. The major player in renewable energy is hydropower, which mostly means building dams and letting water flow through turbines from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. Okay, let's talk about this second story of Feynman's. Uh, 
You might have seen Christopher Nolan is making a film about Oppenheimer. I think it comes out next year, Oppenheimer, uh, which is going to be following, you know, what happened at Los Alamos, where he was in charge. Uh, and Feynman was there, right? Little Richard uh, Oppenheimer referred to him as, as I said previously, Feynman was just a postgrad student. But anyway, I really hope at least one of these stories, if not both, are in this Oppenheimer movie because I think it would be a tragedy if it... They weren't, they just provide so much comic relief. Uh, and Feynman is such a character. I really hope some of his famous stories make it in. But anyway, let me tell you this story. Someone told them how to pick locks, right? And then they got these filing cabinets which had safe combinations. But the fact that he was able to pick locks, apparently, you know, interested him in, in the safety of the whole thing. And one of Feynman's diseases in life is anything that's secret he tries to undo. And so those filing cabinets, you know, made by some company, right? which they put all of their documents in, you know, everyone had them. They represented a challenge to Feynman, how they held open. So Feynman worked on them and he worked on them. There's all kinds of stories about how you could fill the numbers and listen to things and so on. They're true and Feynman understood this apparently, right? But they were, that's for old fashioned safes. These things had a new design so that nothing would be pushing against the wheels while you're trying to blah, 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 right? So none of the old methods would work. And so Feynman read books about locksmiths and they always say at the beginning how you could, you know, safe's underwater and a woman is drowning and somehow he opens a safe. And he had, does, he had no idea how the hell they op open these safes. And they don't tell you anything sensible. It doesn't sound like they can really open the safes that way, right? Like guess the combination on the basis of the psychology of the person who owns it. So he always figured he'd keep it secret. You know, he kept working. And so kind of like a disease, he kept working on these things until he found out a few things. First, he found out you know, how big a range you need to open these safes, how, how close you need to be. And then he invented this system by which you could, could try all the combinations that you have to try 8,000 of them, right? Which you could be within two of every number. It turns out that, you know, every fifth number out, out of 100, 8,000 combinations, right? And then he worked out a scheme by which he could try numbers, you know, without altering the number that he'd already, already set by, cor by correctly moving the wheel. So he could do it in eight hours by trying all the combinations. And then he discovered it still further. This took him about two years of researching, right? He had nothing to do up there, you see, and he was fiddling. Finally, he discovers a way, you know, that's easy to take the last two numbers of the combination of the safe if the safe was open. If the drawer had pulled out, right, and you turn the number and you see the bolt of the lock, you play around, you find out which number comes back as and stuff like that. With a little trickery, you could get the combination off. And so he used to practice this like a card dealer. You'd come in here, talk to some guy, you'd kind of lead against the, you know, the filing cabinet, and you wouldn't even notice he's doing it, right? And you just play with the file, you just play with the dial, you just play with the dial, you're just taking a few numbers off. And so he goes back to his office and he writes the numbers down. And, he, and he, <laughs> the last two numbers of the three, right? If you had the last two numbers, it takes a minute to try. You know, the first number, there's only 20 possibilities. And so three minutes to open a safe if you know the last two numbers. And so he got an excellent reputation for safe cracking, right? They would tell him, Mr. Schmaltz is out of town. We, you know, we need documents from the safe. Can you open it? <laughs> and he'd say, yes, I can open it. I have to get my tools. He doesn't need any tools. So he goes to his office. You know, you look, you look at the number of the safe and he had the last two numbers. He had everybody's safe's numbers by that time. And he, he put a screwdriver in his back to account for the tool he, he claimed he needed. He goes back to the room and he would close the door, right? With the attitude, you know, this business about how you're opening safe is not something anybody should know because it's, it, it makes everything unsafe. It's dangerous, right? If everyone knows how to do this, he closes the door. And he sits down, he reads a magazine, <laughs> and he'd average about 20 minutes, he claims, of just doing nothing. And then he'd open it to see, actually he would open it right away. And then he would sit there for 20 minutes to give himself you know, the representation that it wasn't too easy. There was no tricks involved, right? And so you know, he would get a sweat on, a little bit of sweat, and he would bring it out and there you go. And then at one particular moment, he did open a safe purely by accident and that helped you know, to enforce the reputation uh, it was a sensation, right? It was, a, it was luck, the same kind of luck as in the other story. And so after the war was over, he, w he goes back to Los Alamos to finish some papers, right? And there he did some safe opening. And he claims he could write a safe cracker book, you know, better than any safe cracker. And start at the beginning, he explained how he opened the safe with, you know, absolutely cold without knowing the combination, which contained all the secrets, more secrets than any safe that's been opened. He, he opened a safe which contained the secrets of the atomic bombs. All the secrets of formulas, the rates at which neutrons are liberated from uranium, how much uranium you need to make a bomb, all the theories, all the calculations, the whole damn thing. This is the way it was done. And so he was trying to write this report. He needed this report. It was a Saturday. He thought everyone was at work. He thought it was like Los Alamos used to be. So he goes down the library 
you know, Library de los Alamos has all these documents. And there was this great vault with a great knob and different kind of knob. And he had no, he knew nothing about it. He knew these filing cabinets. He's only an expert on filing cabinets. But not only that, there were guards walking by, you know, this thing with guns. And you can't get that one open, he thought to himself. And so he didn't get that one. And he, but he thought, wait, old Freddie Dorfman in the declassification section, you know, he's in charge of declassifying documents, which documents can now be declassified. And so he had to run down the library and back so often, he got tired of it, right? And so he got this weird idea. If you get a copy, he get a copy made of every document, you know, in Los Alamos library, and he'd stick it in this filing cabinet. And he had these nine filing cabinets, right, one right next to the other, in two rooms full of all the documents of Los Alamos. And Feynman knew he had this. So he goes up to Dorfman, and he thought, I'll ask him to borrow the documents, right? So he goes up to his office, he opens the office door, and it, you know, it looks like he's coming back, the light is lit, and it looks like he's coming back any minute. So he waits. And as always, when he's waiting, he fills with the knobs. <laughs> and he tries 10, 20, 30. 20, 40, 60, didn't work. You know, he tried everything. So, you know, he's waiting, nothing to do. Then he begins to think, you know, those locksmiths people, you know, he's never been able to figure out how to open coal. Maybe they don't either. Maybe all of this stuff is telling him about psychology is actually right. And he, he thinks to himself, I'm going to open this one by psychology. So first thing, first thing in the book, it says, you know, the secretary is very often nervous that she'll forget the combination. And she's been told the combination that she might forget. And so the boss might, you know, forget that she has to know. And so she nervously writes it somewhere. It lists places where the secretaries might write combinations, right? It starts out with, you know, the most clever thing. Start right out with you open the drawer and the wood along the side of the drawer and the outside is written, you know, carelessly a number as if it was an invoice number, but that's the combination, right? Okay. So it's on the side of the desk. Okay. So Feynman remembers this out of the book. So he picked the lock easily for this, you know, drawer. So he pulls it out the drawer and he looks on the side. No, it's all right. It's all right. So there's a lot of papers in the drawer. He fishes around amongst the papers and finally he finds a nice little piece of paper which is the Greek alphabet, alphabet, gamma, and so forth. Carefully printed, because all the secretaries needed to know how to, you know, these letters when they made calls. And so the, they all had these, right? But carelessly scrolled across the top is pi, you know, 3.14159. Why would she need the numerical value of pi? She's not computing anything. And so Feynman goes up to the safe, you know, it's like any other book, this is how it was done. 31, 14, 59. Doesn't open. Doesn't open. 41, 31. 20 minutes. He's turning pie upside down. Nothing happens. And so he, he started walking out of the office and he remembered that book about psychology. He thinks, you know, it's true. Psychologically, he's right. Freddie Doffman is just the kind of guy who would use a mathematical constant for his safe combination. And so the other important, you know, math constant is E. And so he walks back to the safe. 27, 18, 28, click. It opens. <laughs> and then just, you know, he, he walks around to check that all the other the filing cabinets have the same, and they did. <laughs> in total, Hydro has been the most fatal in terms of accidents, with hundreds of thousands of deaths in the last half century. One accident clearly stands out, the 1975 Bankau hydroelectric dam failure in China, which has striking similarities to Chernobyl. Old technology, Poor design and poor management by authoritarian governments concerned about appearances. In a nutshell, a massive typhoon triggered intense flooding that destroyed the dam and, subsequently, a number of smaller dams in a chain reaction, unleashing a flood of over 15 billion cubic meters of water in total. Kilometer-wide waves as high as buildings devastated thousands of square kilometers of countryside and countless communities. All in all, the death toll from just this one accident and its direct consequences is estimated to lie between 85,000 to 240,000. But all of these deaths caused by nuclear and renewable energy are actually negligible in comparison to the real killer energy source, fossil fuel, the most widely used source of energy and electricity. When we burn fossil fuels to heat up water and make turbines spin, or to cause mini explosions to move cars with internal combustion engines, gases like ozone, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide are released into the atmosphere. Breathing in these gases disrupts lung function, which aggravates chronic conditions like asthma and bronchitis, and causes a wide range of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. 
But even more dangerous is the fine particle pollution burning fossil fuels causes. Aim solid and liquid droplets of poisonous substances as small as 2.5 microns in diameter. They easily find their way deep into your lungs and increase the risk of deadly diseases like lung cancer, stroke and heart disease. Fossil fuel-related air pollution is the number one cause of environmental-related deaths in the world. According to the WHO, it accounts for 29% of all cases of lung cancer, 17% of deaths from acute lower respiratory infection, 24% from stroke, 25% from ischemic heart disease, and 43% from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. All in all, outside air pollution adds up to the deaths of 4 million people each year. What makes air pollution especially problematic and sinister is the fact that the damage it causes happens very gradually, which makes it hard for our brains that didn't evolve with subtle dangers in mind to realize the scope of the problem. Collectively, air pollution from fossil fuels is estimated to have killed around 100 million people in the past 50 years. But wait, is that really fair? Fossil fuels also provide over 80% of global energy, so it makes sense that they cause the most deaths. So let's compare deaths per energy unit. Deaths per energy unit produced. A few studies have compared the death rates from different energy sources per one terawatt hour. That's about the annual energy consumption of 27,000 EU citizens, or 12,600 US citizens energy for one year, coal causes 25 deaths, oil causes 18, and natural gas 3. Renewable energy causes one death every few decades. And nuclear, in the worst case, nuclear energy would cause one death every 14 years. One study even found that nuclear energy actually saved 2 million lives between 1971 and 2009 by displacing fossil fuels from the global energy mix. The numbers are clear. Even when using wildly pessimistic numbers, nuclear energy is among the safest forms of energy generation, and at a time when we're struggling to slow down rapid climate change, it's a really valuable low-carbon option. The uncomfortable truth is that we're a space-age civilization that has chosen to eschew technological advances in energy generation because of fear and inertia. Like, we're literally powering the 21st century with 18th century technology which has had pretty bad you know, impacts on our environment and we've been ignoring them for way too long now. You know, whilst there's many ways forward you know, to address this problem, nuclear power has a proven track record, right? And flexibility, uh, you know, it could be a primary source of energy going forward. This might surprise you, but we could fully transition to nuclear in less than 20 years if we wanted to. However, all these facts still leave one major argument that is fielded against nuclear power. Opponents of nuclear energy argue that nuclear waste and its lack of long-term storage solutions is an unacceptable problem and risk, while proponents of nuclear energy say that until renewable energies are able to cover the complete energy demands of mankind, it's arguably safer to store nuclear waste for the time being than to inhale poisonous gases and promote rapid climate change. But a detailed discussion about nuclear waste would go too far here. More about it in our sources. Let us know if you'd like a whole video about it. So looking at the comparative death rates, it's a bit concerning that some countries are replacing nuclear energy with fossil fuels, mostly coal. Especially Germany and Japan have been the most active in dismantling their nuclear fleet. In a ploy to appease the, the German government shut down 11 of its 17 nuclear facilities and plans to close the remaining reactors in 2022. The immediate gap in energy production was filled by temporarily increasing coal production, the energy source with the largest health impacts and the worst consequences for climate change. A 2019 analysis concluded that as a consequence, the nuclear phase-out has led to 1,100 avoidable deaths per year in Germany due to the increased air pollution in the years after 2010. So, in conclusion, nuclear energy feels way more dangerous than it actually is. No matter how you look at it, the one thing we should strive to get rid of as quickly as possible are fossil fuels to prevent the deaths they cause each year and to slow down climate change. Regardless of how much you personally care about climate change issues or which energy source you favor, saving millions of lives should be something we can all agree on.
All right, that'll do for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure you go check out KelvyPN, the free alpha. You guys can go use it for free, and I'll catch you next time.